Hello everyone. Welcome to the supplementary session for clarifications of genomic variant analysis and clinical interpretation workshop. So today, what we are going to do is we are going to annotate one variant with multiple transcripts as we understand that multiple transcripts has been one of the major concern for most of you. So today we are going to annotate one such variant and uh, demonstrate with the help of an example. After which we are going to discuss some of the major questions that most of you had and try to clarify your doubts. So I hope by the end of the session, most of your doubts will be clarified. So let us start with the session. So let us start with the basic workflow to mine literature based evidences. I hope that by now you all are very thorough with this particular workflow, but I will click quickly brush through it. So as you all know, we'll first start with the VCF file. Using this VCF file, we'll annotate the variants present in the file with the help of an online tool called as VEP. VEP will then generate certain details about the uh, variant such as the gene name, the cDNA change and the protein change with the coordinates and the dbsnp ID or the RSID. It will also give out certain other details about the variants which we are not going to use as of now but will be of use in the further sessions. Using these details about the variant then what we will do is we will try to gather literature based evidences and try to assign ACMG attributes to this particular variant and try to understand the clinical consequence of the variant. So let us start with the session. So to begin with we will start with the VCF file which has 8 mandatory columns as you all know. So today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to annotate one of the variants uh, that were assigned in the assignment one. So I'm going to uh, annotate the fourth variant uh, today. So this is the fourth variant. So uh, this is the genomic coordinates of the fourth variant. So firstly, what I will do is I will convert this into a VCF uh, format input. So to do that, what I will do is uh, I will put the chromosome number in column one, position in column two, I'll put a dot in column three, where which is the ID column, and I do not note this detail, and that is why the dot. I will put a reference base as mentioned in the genomic coordinates, and the alternate base as mentioned in the genomic coordinate. I will also put three dots in the next three columns, as I do not note these details about the variant. So this, uh, so what I will do is I will use this line uh, to then uh, to then understand the annotation and use VP. So let us use VP to annotate this variant as of now. So whenever you use VP, just make sure you are using the right assembly version. After that, I will take the radio button for RefSeq transcripts as I need the ref RefSeq annotations. I will take all these checkboxes. I will also take all these checkboxes for uh, allele frequencies. I will need the exon and intron numbers and I will also need the CAD score of the variant and then I will click on run. I do not need any filtering so I will not use any other options. So I will wait for the analysis to get completed and uh, then use the details given out by VEP uh, to mine the literature. So this will take uh, a few seconds to for the job to get completed. So let us view the results. So after annotation for this particular variant, it has given out uh, around six transcripts. So, uh, so let us look at the details that is given out by uh, VP. So as of now, we are only going to use the few for the starting few columns. So as you can see in the cDNA change, uh, there is one transcript and there are six transcripts, but there are only two positions, two different unique, two unique positions. And in the terms of uh, protein change as well, there are only two unique positions. So I'm going to take up these two unique positions of the cDNA change and the protein change. And I will put it in our uh, sheet.
so as you saw that the gene name given out by vep was nlrp3 and after that the cds position i have taken out two positions as i discussed that these are the two unique positions and i have uh, taken out the protein changes as these are the two unique uh, positions and after that i have used the rsid which was given out by vep now we'll use one of each one of these details one by one to annotate this particular variant so we started off with the vcf file then we annotated uh, the variant using vp uh, and we figured out what was the gene name the cdna change and its position we to figure out what is the protein change and the position and dbsnp id and or rsid so next let us use uh, each of these details one by one to annotate the variant so the first thing that we will do is we'll copy use the gene name and the protein position and try to annotate this particular variant so let us now search through uh, google scholar pubmed and pmc so pmc gives around 11 results uh at the at the search of this protein change and pubmed gives around 3 results and uh, google scholar gives about 195 results so obviously there are many results which are uh, not making sense so that is why we will use one of the keywords and the boolean operator that is and and uh, try to uh, remove all the irrelevant articles so now there are about 31 results so now we can easily browse through 31 articles and then try to read so let us now start with pubmed uh, so because we have all the articles in full text in pubmed so that is why let us first read through all the articles that are there in pubmed so there were about 11 results and i opened all of them so let us go through the first paper so we were looking at v 200 m uh, mutation so i just typed that and there are about seven hits so let us briefly go through but then i guess this paper is more of a literature review i cannot find any details in this article so i will just close it so let us go through the next article so here in the uh, abstract itself they are saying we report two families of uh, mutation carriers with variable inflammatory phenotypes so which means uh, we can expect a segregation study so here it says the variant carriers show uh, variable expressivity of the disease and pathogenic role of this mutation may require further investigation so let us read through the family details uh, index case is been suffering from syndrome sister and grandmother have the same mutation sister and mother have no symptoms of the disease yet grandmother started having recurrent fever uh, arthritis since the age of 3 and is currently 60 and has hearing loss uh, so for the second case four year old female has been suffering from two years of age monthly ep episodes girl's father has the same mutation uh but has no clinical symptoms so which means that uh, this particular mutation does not segregate well with the disease because here uh, the sister and the grandmother have the same mutation but uh, do not have the disease so, but then in this particular article no details about its uh, zygosity is given so 
so i am in doubt uh, whether i should really assign uh, the attribute where no segregation is observed or uh, should i just assign the attribute but i will still uh, copy this particular sentence and assign it the attribute of bs4 so this is the pmid that i have been referring to and uh, this is the sentence on the basis of which we are saying that uh, it might be bs4 now let us look at the next article so so here they say co segregation analysis on the available family members revealed that this change is also present in two healthy siblings and it is absent in the affected one uh, so definitely this paper is uh, clearly telling us that uh, this particular variant is a bs4 variant so i will just put in the sentence uh, i will just retrieve the sentence which said that Uh, let us then now look at the next article so that was it about the variant in this particular article so they are talking about this particular variant in this article but i am not getting any other changes so i will search with the other change so they are referring to this particular um, protein change and not the other protein change in this particular article so here they are saying that um, the variant does segregate the proband presented with symptoms two of proband's children subjects 2 and 3 have the same uh, syndrome both dev uh, develop neuro neural deafness one unaffected child does not carry the variant so according to this family it is a a pp1 variant so i will just take this particular sentence from here 
and note it make a note of it let us read through so they are discussing about other syndromes as well so we will in, uh, ignore the other pedigree So here there are individuals with uh, compound genetic variants. So here also they are saying that no clinical consequences in seven asymptomatic carriers. was identified in seven asymptomatic individuals emphasizes the complexity so they are concluding that uh, this in, this variant is actually a bs4 so i will just remove this particular reference from here and keep it as a bs4 reference so let us look at the next article so the next article appears to be a review and i so there is no details about the particular variant we are interested in here it's only diagnosis so i so we can ignore this particular article so here also there are no details about the clinical significance of the variant so i will choose to ignore this article i will move on to the next article so 
so here also there is no particular detail about this particular article so i will move on to the next article so here also i am not finding any relevant information so no in relevant information in this paper as well no information in this paper as well so i have searched through all the articles of uh, uh, pmc but then i have not found any relevant information hence i will move forward so after pmc i will search and read through all articles in pubmed and also all articles that are retrieved in the google scholar search result and then after that what i will do is i will search with the next variant uh, so there is another protein change associated with this particular uh, variant owing to a different transcript hence i will now uh, read through this particular article uh, this particular variants publication mind through this particular variant search so as you can see there are around 7 there are around 267 results in this particular search term so let us be stringent in our search and read only relevant articles so the number of results did not change which means that all articles are probably very relevant uh, and uh, pmc has around 72 articles so let us quickly start reading each one of them so i think few of them we have already uh, read through so we did not go through it again so we will only go through the articles that are uh, not been read before so this appears to be a review kind of uh, article so we need not read such articles so this is a v198 uh, variant so let us search through this so i cannot find any details in this particular article so i will just close through this article so this is only there in the reference so i will close through this article as well so this is a review article so we could go through the references 154 and uh, 154 to 1 156 we will do that later from that particular review because uh, that is the only mention in that particular review and there is no particular particularly great conclusion so 
so we we can ignore this article as well So this was the heterozygous variant. We can ignore this article. So this study confirms a low penetrance of uh, V198M uh, mutation. So which means that our conclusion from multiple papers that this mutation is a BS3. Uh, this mutation is a BS4 mutation is correct. So in this particular article, it's only present in the reference. So I will choose to ignore this article as well. So not much information from this particular article, only there in the reference. Only there in the reference. No details, only there in the reference. It is a low penetrant notation. So this paper talks about treatment, 
only there in the reference so in this way uh, we can browse through all the articles and try to re uh, retrieve relevant uh, publications from these articles uh, then we could proceed to reading the articles in uh, pubmed and which are only 13 and then we could proceed to reading articles in google scholar obviously many of the articles in google scholar would not be uh, available as full text so probably we would have to uh, we would have to write to the uh, authors if we do not find it anywhere Uh, so after we have uh, searched through and read through all articles retrieved via the through protein changes, now it's time to move on to uh, mine the literature using the cDNA change. So there are two cDNA changes as well, which were unique, and we will search through each of them. Uh, so let us now copy the first cDNA change and then uh, browse through. So a Google Scholar retrieved around 23 articles, PubMed retrieved nothing and uh, PMC uh, retrieved one article. Uh, so now let us read through each of these articles and then move on uh, to the next uh, cDNA change. So the next cDNA change gave us around 18 articles in uh, PubMed and uh, two results in PMC, uh, two gave around 18 articles in Google Scholar uh, two results in PubMed and nothing in PMC. Uh, so now we will have to read through each of these articles and then uh, figure out if there are any attributes that we can assign or on the basis of the evidences in these articles. So then after doing all that, then we will look for the RSID changes. Uh, so then we'll copy the RSID and search through each of these uh, databases. And now in this search, we will also include uh, ClinVar and OMIM. So the RSID search gave around 17 results in Google Scholar, no results in PubMed, two results in uh, PMC, and uh, let us look at what is the conclusion. So there is a 2016 conclusion which says it is likely benign and there are two articles associated with it. Uh, then there is a 2018 conclusion which has a uh, evidence detail. Let us read through it. So they say that this variant is reported in healthy individuals as well. unclear whether the variant is pathogenic or benign. So there is another 2020 evidence as well. So it is of uncertain confidence, uh, uncertain significance. So there is a paper which has a functional study about this variant. So we can uh, read through this article uh, and uh, think about if we have to assign the PS3 attribute to this particular variant. And they finally conclude that it, the evidence is insufficient for disease classification. So in this way, we can read through each of these conclusions and uh, find if there are any PMIDs that we should refer to if we have not referred to already and then assign the uh, relevant attributes. So this is how you would use the ClinVar information. And then there are also citations for this particular variant. So uh, we could go through each of these citations in detail uh, after while going through the ClinVar results. So next, let us look at the OMIM results. Uh, so OMIM gave us a uh, hit and then now we are going to search through this particular OMIM for the RSID. So, uh, so there is only one sentence written about this particular uh, variant. In CIAS1 gene, but then we were talking about the NLRP3 gene, so I'm confused whether, whether this is the same gene or not. So, what I would do is I will just uh, search in Google 
uh, for the gene cards of that particular gene. So it is saying NLRB3. So let us look at, so these are the aliases for this particular gene and CIAS1 is also one among them. So which means that uh, we should not ignore this particular result but then this is the but then this result is only a report of that particular variant so i will not go through in detail but then if there would have been some kind of a, a family segregation detail or anything else mentioned about that particular variant then i would have definitely read through that article in detail but here i am not uh, i am choosing not to read the article in detail so like this we could go through omim as well to reach uh, to uh, to understand and reach to a conclusion about uh, what is said about that particular variant because OMIM gives us a brief summary of that particular variant in the uh, literature. So now after going through all of these uh, different search terms and different databases, uh, now we should uh, reach to a conclusion about what all details we found in different articles and uh, what, 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 uh, what is the clinical conclusion we would reach at. Uh, and this would enable us in moving forward. And uh, I hope by now you understood how to search through the different databases using the multiple transcript information of uh, cDNA change and uh, protein change. And you should also remember that uh, we used all of them. We did not ignore any of them. Uh, we picked out all the unique uh, cDNA changes and protein changes and then searched through each of these databases. Uh, and now, uh, I think, I hope that you are more clear about how to search through the literature using multiple uh, transcript informations. So now let us move forward and try. Let us now uh, look at the different questions asked by different uh, participants and try to uh, clarify some doubts. Let us now look at the different questions that were put forth by each of you. So the first question was put forth by Radhika and she says that the ACMG attributes assigning is a little confusing and she wants to explain it. So Radhika, ACMG has laid down guidelines on how to understand the clinical significance of the variant. These guidelines allow the interpretation on the basis of variant features and already known experimental and other details about the variant. These details are attributes which can be ticked off and if these details are known about the variant. On the basis of these attributes, we can then classify the variant as benign or pathogenic. So basically what we are trying to do is, we are trying to go through the literature or publications that are already available on that particular variant and trying to see if there are any ACMG attributes that we can assign on the basis of evidences found in these particular articles. So this is what we are trying to do in the uh, past few weeks. I hope this has clarified your doubt a little bit. And uh, if you have any more specific questions, you can write back to us. So let us now look at the next question. So the next question was put forth by Dr. Usha. And she says, uh, she has two questions. So in the first question, she says that as per Jiva studies, if the OD or the odds ratio is less than five and it is benign, what attribute should be given up uh, and this is the PMID she's referring to. And in the second question, she says in the following PMID, the significance is given in the form of p-value and not uh, odds ratio. So if the odds ratio is less than five, do not assign any attribute. Uh, we understand that the variant is benign, but there is no ACMG attribute that is put forth uh, for if the odds ratio is less than five. So uh, do not assign any attribute. So in the next question, the article is about uh, men's fat. And this is nowhere concerned to our uh, clinical interfer uh, in interpretation. And hence, uh, the article is not relevant to us. So here, what I would like to say is before reading the article, try to understand if it is relevant for us and, it, and if it is relevant for the same disease that we are interested in. If we, if we are not interested in that particular disease and that association, then we should not uh, uh, read such articles or we should ignore such articles. So I hope uh, that your doubt is clarified. If not, you can write back to us. So the next question is put forth by Aditya. So Aditya asks, choosing right transcript from multiple transcript predicted from the output of VP. Is there any PubMed for, to retrieve uh, variant analysis case study only? 
I believe uh, or assume to assign attribute to variant case study papers are more useful and detailed as compared to research papers. So the first thing uh, that I have been trying to say uh, multiple times and there is no need to choose the right transcript. You should use all transcripts that are retrieved from VP. Ideally, as best practice, do not use the transcripts that are given out at Clinvar or OMIM as they might not be indexed and they might be of uh, previous versions. And the uh, for the other question, I do not think your conclusion that you should only read case study papers is correct because uh, there would be other papers which are not case studies but have functional studies around the variant. There would be other papers which have association studies around the variant. So that is why if you search with the keyword of case study only, probably you will not re end up reading all the art relevant articles. And uh, but if you still want to read only the case studies, then you could use uh, the variant and the gene of interest and use the and keyword, which was discussed in session 11. And then you could use the um, case report keyword. So this will re retrieve all the case reports for uh, that are available for that particular variant. So the next question is by Johnny and he asks, Converting the variant to HGBS not, uh, notation using uh, mutilizer resulting in chromosomal variant along with other transcripts, which of these notations should be used at input for VP? So for the assignment, I would like to reiterate that we have given you genomic coordinates. You could uh, use the genomic coordinates and convert them into v, uh, VCF format, which I discussed in this session. And after that, uh, you could use VP to annotate the variant. And along with that, but I would just like to mention that in general, VP uses the ensemble format and the VCF format that we already use uh, and have been using in the previous few weeks. And there are other variant formats such as the RSID, the uh, cosmic database IDs, etc. And also the XGBS nomenclature, which we have discussed in one of the previous sessions. Uh, so VP also accepts input in the form of XGBS uh, nomenclature formats. So these are the different formats uh, using which you can query VEP. But uh, as for the sake of the assignment, we are going to stick to the genomic coordinates in the VCF format. So I hope uh, this has clarified your doubt. So moving on to the next question. So the next question was asked by Dr. Shilpa. So she asked, in the ClinVar database, if we put RSID and search multiple NMIDs and NPIDs will be displayed. Which one do we need to select for annotation? So I would like to reiterate once again that there is no need to choose the right transcript. You could use all transcript retrieved through VP. Here I would like to mention that since she is asking about the ClinVar database, do not use the transcripts and notations from ClinVar or OMIM or any other database as they might be uh, not up updated and uh, they might not be indexed. So you might not be re referring to the most updated version or ID. So that is why I uh, advise you not to use any annotations from ClinVar or OMIM. I advise you to use all the annotations that are given out by VP and not pick and choose on any of the transcripts. Uh, so the next question is by uh, Sri Lekha. Uh, so she asks, I have been able to successfully run the job in VP, but will multiple transcripts in the result, I am unable to figure out which one to work with. For example, in the first question, it is a missense variant. The multiple transcripts also have the same RSID. This is confusing and she does not know how to proceed from here. So I hope that this was solved in uh, with the help of the example that I just demonstrated earlier. You could also refer to session 11 where I have given a hands-on on how to annotate a variant with multiple transcripts. Uh, I hope that this doubt is clarified that you should not, uh, you should use all the transcripts uh, given out by VEP and not miss out on any of them. And uh, here I would like to say that the RSID does not change even if the protein change changes. So it dis depends on the position. So till the position is the same, all the transcripts uh, having different variants uh, would have the same RSID. So that is why uh, do not worry if the RSID is the same. It is correct. So the next question is by Anika who asks, so what is the BP6 attribute? So the BP6 attribute has not been discussed as of now because this is not one of the attributes that we mine from the literature. So that is why this has not been discussed. It will be discussed in detail in one of the further sessions. Uh, so just to uh, add to it, this attribute is assigned uh, on the basis of ClinVar or any other reputable database. And this can be automated. So that is why we have not discussed this particular attribute as this is not derived from literature. Uh, 
moving on to the next question. So Dr. Manoj asks, why doing practice sheet one for the given variant, we can have different effects of the variant for different transcripts and positions. So I want to ask which one should we consider while solving for ACMG? Uh, one example should have been explained of the variant with more than one NMID or NPID. So this example was discussed in session 11 where the variant had multiple NMID uh, and NPID. But I would like to reiterate that use all the variants, do not ignore any variant. And uh, I think by now this is very clear. So the next question is by Dr. Mukul. Uh, so the first question is when we have a study with multiple patients wearing a pathological variant, does that qualify for PP1S? So yes, if you have multiple patients having the similar symptoms or phenotype and they all have that variant, then you can assign the attribute of PP1S. Uh, second question is how to use review articles of a variant for annotation. So uh, how you could use review articles is that you should read the review article, understand what is the conclusion drawn in the review article and uh, for that conclusion they might have given a reference. So go back to the reference, read the reference in detail and then figure out or decide as to whether you should assign um, that particular ACMG attribute to that particular variant. So the important point is that from the review article, go back to the reference and then read the reference in detail before deciding on any uh, ACMG attribute annotation. So the next question is, I came across a few protein change whose nomenclature was mentioned as changed in ClinVar and the older name is still showing in articles and literature stage. Are they eligible for annotation? What are the region, reasons for such a change? So uh, what happens is uh, the literature that we are reading is from, uh, from a long time from now and the annotations keep updating as the sequencing technology is updated and there is a better uh, sequence available, better and more accurate sequence available for a particular protein or a particular transcript etc so um, as the updation happens there are newer transcripts and there are newer ids and all this annotation keeps updating periodically after some time so that is why some literature might have old annotations some literature might have different annotations and that is why we need to search using different ids and multiple ids and multiple changes so this is the reason why we are using so many search terms for uh, retrieving uh, details about the same variant. Uh, so the fourth question is that why no significance is given to odds ratio one to five. So uh, on the basis of odds ratio, we assign the PS4 attribute. As you already understand that PS4 is, uh, is an attribute counting towards strong pathogenicity. So if we have to assign a strong pathogenicity evidence to a particular variant, definitely we should be very sure of the pathogenicity of the variant. And hence we want to be very sure of the association between the disease and the variant. And that is why we are taking a uh, very, uh, very stringent uh, cutoffs for this particular annotation. And that is why we are considering only uh, odds ratio greater than five for uh, annotation of PS4 attribute. I hope your doubts are clear. Uh, if not, you could write back to us. Uh, so Chitavrita asks, uh, how do we determine the uh, variant is cis or trans? So I read through this particular article that you have mentioned and uh, I found this sentence in that particular article that another sequence variation located downstream was observed on the same allele, data not shown. And uh, since it is present on the same allele, you can uh, annotate the variant as cis variant as it is present on the same allele. If it would have present on, uh, if, you'd, if it would have been present on different allele, then you would have annotated the variance as trans. So you can assign the corresponding attributes uh, for this particular variant from this particular paper. Sometimes, here I would also like to add that sometimes the chromatogram is given in that particular paper and from that chromatogram or the sequencing data, then you can understand if the variant is cis or trans. But sometimes if no other detail is given and uh, just a text form, just in the text format, if uh, this particular information is given, then you can use this particular information that is provided in the text format. Uh, so I hope your doubt is clarified. If not, you could write back to us. So the next question is by Sanobar and uh, is it possible that different ACMG attributes for one uh, variant can be found in different publications? If yes, I believe we need to mention all the articles and the other option of the Google sheet. Yes, 
uh, all attributes should be given depending on the publication and uh, if even if there are some contrasting uh, attributes or uh, even if there are contrasting details in different publications it, the contrasting details should be added and in the end we will tally all the attributes to understand the clinical significance so don't worry about it just add all whatever attribute you can make out of from any publication and give the uh, pmid in the other option of the google sheet if possible uh, the next question is by Siddharth and uh, many of the papers in the literature for association studies report the results in p-value, but for assigning the PS4 attribute, the result should be in odds ratio. How to carry out this con uh, conversion? So you can uh, do this conversion if there are the number of cases and controls are uh, available. You could refer to session eight for details. I will also be uh, giving out um, this answer in the form of an email. So you could refer to the email as well to carry out how uh, to figure out how to carry out this conversion. I hope it will be clear by then. Or uh, you could also refer to session eight uh, video for the details. So the next question is by Ramya. Is there a way to look out for association studies in the assignment? This time we've been asked to give de novo attributes for each of the variants. So with each cDNA or protein chain should we include de novo as a search word? So the so for the first question, you do not need to uh, search particular for, particularly for association studies. If you do, uh, look at all articles for that particular variant, you will encounter uh, any article if there is any association done on that particular variant and disease. So do not look for association studies in particular. And for the next question, do not include the keyword de novo. If there are any uh, if there are any publications which have such kind of details, it will come up in the search uh, while reading all the articles about the variant. So you do not need to give any keywords uh, or as search terms. I hope your doubt is clear. The next question is by Vaishnavi and she asks, for some common mutations, there are many articles and some give con conflicting attributes. So how do we choose which article to give importance? Also, for some articles, I couldn't find the articles mentioned in the today's session, which in case I wouldn't assign the attributes. So ultimately, I might assign the variant to be likely benign or rather VUS or likely pathogen. How to avoid this pitfall? So Vaishnavi, uh, do not pick and choose articles. If Even if there are contrasting or conflicting attributes given out in different publications on the basis of their experimental evidence, you just give out the attribute as mentioned in that particular publication. Do not mention, uh, do not worry if you are giving contrasting attributes. Just assign all articles, all attributes as per the article's interpretation. And about finding uh, articles, uh, what you could do is you could use free resources such as Unpayball, ResearchGate, etc., uh, where you can find articles. You could also do a simple Google search and see if the article is available. If you cannot find the article on any of the free resources such as PubMed, um, Unpayball, ResearchGate, etc., the last option would be to con uh, contact the authors and wait uh, before you give out your final annotation. So that the last option would be to uh, contact the authors, which is all obviously time taking. So I hope your doubt is clarified. So the next question is by Namya and she asks, would it be wrong to assign PP1 attribute to the variant that would qualify for PP4 or should we assign both attributes to that particular variant? So if the variant qualifies the criteria for both attributes, you could assign both the attributes. Uh, I hope your doubt is clarified. So the next question is by Rajit and he asks, what does X represent in a protein change? So X represents a nonsense mutation. If you are still confused about this, you could go through the first few sessions of our workshop where we have discussed about the very basics of uh, genomics. So you could go back and refer to those sessions if you are still uh, confused or if you still require more details. Uh, so the second question is, if the paper mentions about the p-value in GVAS and odds, odds ratio, should we calculate the odds ratio from the available data? Uh, so sometimes the odds ratio is mentioned and in such cases there is no need to calculate. But if the, if the odds ratio is not mentioned and uh, there are details about the number of cases and controls, then you can cal calculate the odds ratio from this particular uh, numbers. And for that, I will be sending about uh, sending a mail in which there are details on how to calculate the odds ratio. Apart from that, you could also refer to the previous sessions where this was discussed. Uh, the third question is, if instead of the NM and NPID, VEP pro provides the gene name and the protein change, uh, 
as ENST IDs, then what does this mean? This means that you have not uh, take the check uh, the radio button for uh, RevSeq. So take the radio button for RevSeq and not for Ensemble or any other thing. Uh, if you check the radio button for RevSeq, you will get the name and NP IDs. For uh, cis and trans uh, variants, should the paper mention about these articles explicitly or can we assume? So we cannot assume anything from the disease status. Either it should be mentioned explicitly in the text form or it should be mentioned uh, in the uh, chromatogram or could be interpreted from sequencing data. But do not assume anything from the disease status. So the last question is, if a gene and its proteins are associated with multiple diseases and it gives different attributes in GVAS, uh, segregation uh, how should we proceed so if a, uh, if so if it even if it is associated with multiple diseases if in that particular paper the disease that you are looking at and the variant is the same and is of your interest then you could look at the article but if the disease is of not of your interest and is of some common uh, nature such as men's fat etc that we discussed in one of the previous questions then you could ignore such articles so refer to articles only if the variant and the disease is of your interest. So the next question is by Dr. Gunjan. So she asks, uh, Clinvar, Omem, VP, etc. directly categorize the variants as per clinical relevance. Should this categorization suffice if one has a current variant ID uh, or should one still fully do the literature search on PubMed or PMC? So I would like to uh, say that if this uh, categorization would be sufficient, then we wouldn't have to do all this hard work of uh, searching continuously using different search terms in different uh, publication databases, etc. So uh, why this should be done is that uh, the categorization given in Clinvar, Omem, etc. is not updated very frequently. And in that period, time period, there might have uh, been any new articles that have come up. So that is why you should perform the literature search uh, with the latest articles and only this will lead to the correct interpretation. Do not completely depend on the categorization given out by Clinvar, Omim and BP. So the next question is by uh, Roshan. So the first question is that isn't transcripts obtained from BP sufficient? Should we also use mutilizer? So no, the transcripts obtained from BP is sufficient. You do not need to uh, use mutilizer if uh, BP results are already there. So second question is, if in the supporting info provided in Clinvar, ACMG attributes were given for certain variants, can we use them for annotations too? So as I mentioned in the previous question, no, do not use the ACMG attributes that were uh, mentioned in the uh, Clinvar. What you could do is you could refer to those papers and give out the attributes uh, on your own if you are convinced about the uh, assignment of ACMG attributes. And uh, But apart from that, you should do the regular searches in Google Scholar, PubMed, uh, PMC, uh, OMIM, and Clinvar. So do the regular searches and then uh, try to compare yours with the ClinVar results. So do not completely depend on the ClinVar results. So the third question is that if we have NM transcript only and no NP transcript, should we use that one since there is no protein produced? Yes, if there is only NM transcript and no NP transcript, then use whatever is available. In the examples NR and XM, what do NR and XM transcripts mean? So these are IDs of the RefSeq database and you could uh, refer to the RefSeq database for more details about them. Is there a way or tool to figure out the attributes we are assigning is right or wrong? So there is no way to do that. But what you could do is if there are already available annotations, you can just compare your annotations with their annotations and then uh, see if you are you both are going on the uh, same way or if you are assigning any contrasting attributes. But you could uh, read about the already available annotations for that particular variant. Uh, what does confidence interval mean? So confidence interval is a means to assess the dependability of the odds ratio. It's like uh, a significance or a p-value given to the odds ratio. So uh, confidence interval is very important. If we uh, get 100 plus results for a single search, how do we proceed? So you should continue reading all the articles till further articles do not seem to have that particular variant. So as you go on reading the articles uh, at one particular time, you will come to know that most of the articles that you are reading now are uh, do not have that particular variant or have that particular in the reference section or have that particular variant in some other uh, DOI section, etc., where it is not relevant. Uh, so that is why uh, if you encounter that most of the papers now do not have that variant or do not have the association with that variant and gene, then you could stop reading 
uh, for that particular uh, variant. So the next question is by Ashish. So if a mutation is present only in the disease cases and absent in controls, uh, can the mutation be classified as PS4? So no, the mutations cannot be classified as PS4 unless the odds ratio is provided. Uh, and do not assume anything only on the basis of uh, such uh, numbers. If the publication only mentions p-value for the association of a mutation with the disease, but not odds ratio, how can we result, interpret the results as per ACMG guidelines? So we cannot interpret the results without odds ratio. So, uh, so if the number of cases and controls is given, you can cal calculate the odds ratio. This is discussed in one of the previous sessions and also I have written out an email as to how you would do that. Uh, so you can refer to the email or the previous sessions uh, for how to calculate the odds ratio from the number of cases and controls. And um, only then with the help of this odds ratio, you can interpret the results. Otherwise, you cannot. How can we interpret a mutation that is reported in a patient but no follow-up of their family is performed? So if there is a mutation that is reported in a patient, but uh, if there are no other details about that particular uh, variant, that is uh, no functional studies are done around that variant, no details about the family and their segregation of the variant is given, or if there are no association uh, of the variant given, then uh, such articles are of no use to us and you cannot assign ACMG attributes on uh, the basis of such articles. So you can choose to ignore such articles. So thank you very much. I hope by this session, most of your doubts are clarified. If you have, if you still have any more uh, doubts or need any more clarifications, you could write back to us. Thank you very much.